And one of the real questions is how do we apply these marvelous new genetic tools in, um, in our research? And I guess one perspective is, is that uh, if you want to look forward in terms of, of the use, use of this, it's probably medicine isn't the right place to look forward. Look at that, because the, the whole genetics um, revolution has already had a major impact on human health, and it's probably been through nutrition. If you look at uh, uh, rice yields, uh, this year we're looking at the largest rice crop in the world, uh, uh, yield in the world, and obviously we're going to need it uh, given the, uh, the commodities issues, but the um, uh, and a, a variety of, of things having to do with uh, with uh, plant genetics, et cetera. Just to give you a little um, introduction, my own um, experience with this is this is Taproots. This is my vineyard in upstate New York. I have a, a vineyard on Cuca Lake, um, which is one of the Finger Lakes, which uh, grows most of the uh, wine in upstate New York. And uh, uh, some of my grapes are these. These are, are good old Concord grapes. These are American grapes. There's, nobody's been fiddling with these. These are Native American grapes. Um, but uh, you don't see a whole lot of uh, bottles of Concord wine uh, on the shelf, uh, at least not anymore. Um, and uh, ours goes to uh, grape juice, um, uh, Welch's grape juice. And, uh, and so those haven't been fiddled with. But if you're going to go into something more interesting, um, there are these uh, um, all sorts of, of gene products. And um, most of that comes from the Cornell Experimental Station, which is in Geneva, New York, which is about 10 miles from my vineyard. And I like to go over there and watch them fiddle around with their grapes, um, which is practical genetics. And these are uh, French varietals, which uh, which are bred for um, cold hardiness, um, tannin structure, uh, um, all sorts of things, um, and um, and you can kind of pick out. So if you're into agriculture, you know that genetics has already had a, a huge impact and provides us with beautiful products. These are some seedless grapes, um, which are table grapes, and they're. Um, uh, obviously, um, crossbreeds of crossbreeds of crossbreeds of crossbreeds. So genetics has already had a huge impact on human health, but we're into uh, medicine and, and the clinical sides of things. So what I wanted to talk about was, was talk a little bit in finishing here about uh, some of the inferences we can make that gene variants are caused by a disease and kind of switching from what the usual evidence we want in in epidemiology to the new context of the, the, the results of the tools we have, kind of a translation of those results, uh, the, infer the inferences we make in epidemiology to the tools we have in genetics. Then really talk about personalized medicine a little bit. A lot of places are starting personalized medicine programs, and obviously uh, many of these are based on genetic tools. Uh, this obviously is a whole course but I want to just touch on two issues, genetic screening and pharmacogenetics, and then talk a little bit about, um, uh, very briefly, some uh, application, further applications of genetic tools to um, research and experimental studies. Well, I think the first thing that struck me um, as I retooled in, uh, in genetics and, uh, and took the, um, um, the Bar Harbor course and, um, and read um, in my, um, my various um, textbooks, et cetera, uh, is that genome-wide association studies of, of, and, and the whole genetic um, genomic uh, revolution already has had a tremendous impact on basic science. And one of the comments on Terry's last lecture was, was that as you go and look at these genome-wide association studies, I'd ask you how many epidemiology lectures have you seen recently which right in the middle of the results will have a cell expression study or a histopathology analysis or a knockout model, mouse model, in the middle of what in essence is an epidemiology study. I just it just, this just totally blew me away. And they're the functional studies that, that Terry was talking about. They're very appropriate there. 
And so, to some extent, this is reverse translation. We're talking about translational science and going from bench to bedside. Well, this is actually going from population with the genome-wide models back to say, what is this? You've got this snip in the middle of a gene desert. Okay, folks, uh, go out and find out what's going on here. And that, the message is not to other epidemiologists, oftentimes, it's back to our basic genetic scientists. So this is, um, I was asking a conference, or somebody asked the, the audience at a conference one, one day, tell me one thing that uh, population science has done for the basic scientists. Well, I got it to the, 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 the microphone and basically said, well, here it is. Here's a whole lot of work for a whole lot of people of insights that we didn't have before. So, so this, this whole insights into genome structure and function, you can, you can see that just in the matter of a few years, um, the interest in some of these introns and regulatory elements obviously is sparked, uh, is, is renewed um, interest sparked in them. Uh, these novel mechanisms of disease um, obviously are, are um, um, the, these insights of, of, that we, we actually probably know very little about how diseases occur. Uh, from some of these come um, proteins as, as therapeutics, um, particularly in the uh, area of uh, clotting. Uh, but obviously some of these have been cloned proteins and these are useful. And then the other things, of course, was that as we come up with these novel mechanisms of disease, um, you have uh, new drug targets. You find another receptor, another uh, enzyme, another. And uh, I've been very impressed with these ability to mass screen small mo molecule inhibitors where you can come up with a gene and then just run through hundreds of thousands of small proteins and get some hits to ones which will inhibit that receptor, et cetera, and then go on to animal work, phase one. And so uh, the, the rapidity and the magnitude of this is just mind-boggling, but certainly the fuel for this are going to be these novel um, uh, drug uh, targets, which obviously deal with novel mechanisms of disease. So um, if you, um, I think some of um, um, Eric Lander and some of the visionary people in this kind of um, cringe a little bit when you try to pin them down about how genome-wide association studies have, have affected clinical medicine. But no one's arguing about how much they've really opened our insights into basic science. But I'm a little bit more optimistic than that. So you're all familiar with the Surgeon General's um, criterion. And so what I thought might be interesting in, in this kind of summary way is to say we're reading all of these genome-wide association studies. How can we be sure? In the same way, how can we be sure that a behavior or a, a physiologic measure or a um, uh, a laboratory measurement uh, has to do with causality, and, and you're all familiar with this. Um, but l let's look at each of these in the context of um, the, the genome association uh, issues and maybe uh, make some comments. Well, Terry's already mentioned to say, well, the genes there, the temporal relationship's not an issue, and I guess that's true. Uh, but there obviously is a subgroup of individuals who are also interested in, in expression of the gene, not just its presence in the genome, but its expression, these expression arrays and a variety of things. And this is a temporal issue um, because what this suggests is that the disease occurs during which time a disease is not quiescent. It's being expressed and it's active. And so even this temporal relationship, obviously, I think, could have some opportunities um, for, um, for studies which are looking at not only that the, the gene is present, but it's being expressed. And some of the functional studies that have been talked about deal with that, is, is that these are expressed in the tissue of interest, for example. Uh, I want to comment on the strength of association again. The, the nice uh, question came up uh, before. but. Um, uh, what you have is, is multiple SNPs and other gene variants, um, and, and they all um, add to risk. And one of the real questions is, what is the composite risk of all the variants, known and unknown? And Terry's shown a little bit about how, it's, how those might be explained. But I wondered if, if um, well, and then we're going to talk a little bit about dose response is also um, relevant here, and in this context, it would be the number of alleles. In other words, 
uh, non heterozygous homozygous for the um, susceptibility wheel. So you can do dose response uh, within this, uh, obviously, and uh, recessive versus dominant. One of the things I've been thinking about was just to do some back of the envelope scratching out about this idea that was discussed about why you get such small odds ratios. And let's just do a little hypothetical um, um, study of a 2,000 smoker, a case, um, a case control study um, um, with, uh, say, uh, uh, 2,000 smokers and 2,000, um, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 people with a disease and 2,000 people without disease. So whatever disease you'd like, cancer, heart disease, whatever. And when you do the odds ratios, of course, you get an odds ratio of 2.25. And so this looks at the entire exposure by cigarette smoking. But let's see, what would you think if, in fact, you weren't uh, smart enough to do all that together, and in fact, you had to dice this up into individual uh, exposures within the same class? Let's assume that 10% of individuals smoke camel cigarettes. And all you can do is measure camel cigarettes, OK? Well, here what you see is 10% of the uh, individuals are smokers. The denominator here is do not is not do not smoke. It's do not smoke camels. Okay, and in this instance, then you get a, a much smaller odds ratio, less than uh, half as as strong really in terms of uh, of uh, um, risk above one. And I think this is what's happening. In many ways, I'm not even talking about gene gene associations, but if in fact um, you put together Marlboros and Winstons and Kents and all the other coffin nails that we could come up with. Um, you, you would be able to add all those together and come up with uh, with with such. And I think that's just a, in plain terms, kind of an illustration of what we're we're doing and trying to put all of these risks together. And again, I think we may not know all of the the culprits in in this area, but just to try to put it into something that. Um, could be a little bit more quantitatively understandable. This is just this illustration of the alleles. Um, uh, here's uh, um, uh, risk uh, um, genes associated with, um, with the breast cancer in this study by Easton. Um, here's the odds ratio per allele. Uh, and if you look within the data, uh, the um, the odds ratio associated with, with being heterozygous for, for these um, risk alleles or homozygous for this, you can see obviously there is this, this uh, dose response, um, perhaps not so impressively down here. Um, but, um, but the point is, is that I think one can fulfill what we like to see, of course, in, in our studies is um, some dose response, although the, um, the dominant and um, recessive issues, I think, become more complicated. We just had a, um, a lecture on replication of finding, um, uh, and I don't want to say more than that, other than that, that, um, that um, the genetics community, and, and particularly um, Steve Chanuk and Terry's leadership, I, I think have been really quite much more militant about requiring these replications uh, than the epidemiology community has had in its previous studies. And uh, I think this has uh, been a very positive uh, response to this alpha error issue. Uh, the biologic plausibility, of course, you've just heard uh, what, what this is about are, are the functional studies about why this could be occurring. Um, and, um, and these are an important part. Um, uh, one wonders uh, if um, if one needs in vivo studies, some of the uh, knockout or knock-in uh, models um, would be um, at what point, what are the standards of functional studies? I, I, you know, there's, you'll see tremendous heterogeneity. Some of them will be essentially a bibliographic um, a look at um, a gene location and possibly expression. Uh, others will get into some of the other uh, much more convincing uh, issues of actually gene product measurement and uh, uh, yeah, a tissue expression um, and um, uh, animal models. So, so um, I haven't seen a lot about kind of the what would be um, kind of your minimum requirements. 
the consideration of alternate explanations, uh, obviously some of these models are very complex. Uh, and so um, when one finds an association, one wonders um, how these all fit together. Um, this attribution of, of genetic risk, I think, would be one approach to say, well, if, if, um, if we can understand much of the heritability or the familial association, uh, we would get an idea that uh, we've identified all of the parts of these complex models. And I think we're still uh, away from that. So uh, this whole heterogeneity, obviously, I've showed this slide before in terms of, of the possible explanations and, uh, and, uh, and mechanisms of, of, of heterogeneity. Uh, and I think these we need to keep in mind. The, um, the various uh, sites, of course, um, uh, again, um, many of the GWAS studies have looked at SNPs related to exons and introns, but this the whole area of uh, regulatory elements and uh, how these things interact on a single gene basis, to say nothing about a multi-gene basis, obviously is part of the complexity that, um, and so these alternate explanations, unfortunately, are virtually infinite. Uh, this is uh, the Easton study again, and as part of that uh, analysis, um, actually this is a second Easton paper, which um, specifically um, uh, I think um, was looking at this issue of additional familial risk. So the point they were making is that it's a known breast cancer lo loci, such as the BRCA and, um, um, uh, and such genes, really only explain 25% uh, or less of familial risk of breast cancer. Now, there could be environmental, and obviously, but, uh, but um, in general, looking at the family histories of breast cancer and the risks that that imparts, only about 25% of that could be explained by the known uh, genetic markers. So what they did was, was a two-stage study which uh, essentially excluded individuals with these markers, uh, 4,400 cases, 4,300 controls, uh, and, um, and within the replication of SNPs in these huge numbers of cases controls, um, and found these five novel loci related to breast cancer at the P to the minus, 10 to the minus uh, seventh. Uh, and these novel loci then identified an additional 3.6% of risk, again, possibly on top of that 25%. But just to give you an idea of, of the complexity and, and the things ahead, they also noted in one of those QQ plots that Terry showed you uh, is, is that there were 1,792 additional SNPs associated at the P less than 0.05 level where there are only about um, 343 expected, suggesting about 450 additional SNPs in excess that would appear to be um, uh, having something to do with susceptibility and maybe um, having a role in, in, in the, the complex nature. So um, this whole idea of alternate explanations and the ability to account for familial risk, I think, is something that's going to continue to uh, be a challenge. Um, this issue of cessation of exposure is interesting. Um, obviously, um, this uh, knock-in or knock-out, this gene replacement therapy is not a topic I'm going to get into. Obviously, it um, has its own levels of controversy. But we do have a number of interventions which replace uh, defective gene products. Uh, to suggest that, um, and I'm going to give you one from um, Dr. Collins' laboratory, but um, certainly um, familial hypercholesterolemia, for example, um, heterozygous FH, we've been uh, working on this for a while, in essence, of uh, upregulating the, um, the um, LDL uh, receptor um, um, to make up for the one that doesn't work. Um, so. The, but I think we're going to see more with, with the insights of the receptors and the drug targets that, that they offer us. We're going to be seeing a lot more of this. And there are several exciting ones rumbling around now in the development stage. Uh, the consistency with other knowledge obviously has to do with functional evidence again, et cetera, and uh, animal models. 
And then finally, um, the specificity of association uh, obviously was kind of based on one gene, one protein. But even that, I think, is being shaken a little bit uh, by now a couple of examples, and I'll show you one of these shared association um, of diseases with gene variants, uh, in which you would appear to have one variant which is related to two different diseases. And, uh, um, and um, so there, this specificity, which is one of the lower ranked uh, levels of causative evidence, uh, may in fact uh, not be so causative. This is from um, Dr. Francis Collins' lab. It's a New England Journal paper published recently on this uh, progeria syndrome. Um, you've probably seen cases of this. Um, uh, these are uh, children who um, are born and, uh, and uh, undergo a, an accelerated aging process um, um, to the point that um, uh, they die of cardiovascular disease, interestingly, from the dropout of cells in their um, arterial media by about the age of 13 years. So obviously a severe a disease. And now the defect has been found with, with, um, with um, modern genomic uh, tools. It's this, um, uh, this substitution um, of, of one glycine to the next in a, in a codon, um, which has been basically a, a cryptic uh, splice donor uh, that produces an abnormal protein. This obviously gets to be kind of um, uh, an unusual uh, mechanism and variant that, that leads to this abnormal protein laminae, um, which has to do with, with a chunk of it missing um, so that it cannot release from a tether site um, on the nuclear membrane. And then as the cell tries to, uh, to uh, transcribe proteins, this alters transcription uh, and uh, the, uh, they have widespread uh, growth uh, failure, et cetera. Um, the idea here was then, okay, now we've got a, a gene and a gene target, and once you understand all of these things, which this New England Journal paper describes, uh, then what you have is the opportunity to, to fiddle with some of the gene products and what's going on downstream um, and, and basically, um, in animal models and in cell models, uh, um, inhibition of this uh, enzyme prevents this, this anchoring of, of this abnormal protein, which then th thereafter can't release and buggers up the cells. So what, what essentially, um, as Dr. Collins describes this, this goes in from uh, some of this descriptive work and some of this functional work uh, rapidly into an open-label clinical trial of, of an inhibitor of this to see if they can get these children to start growing. It just illustrates the, the idea of once you understand the gene targets and then can survey for these, these small molecules that will be able to affect those gene targets, the opportunities that have never, we've never had before of really doing something that otherwise we would have said is just an untreatable uh, genetic disease. And I think that's part of the excitement of the whole thing. And there's a number, there's a subgroup of the Marfan syndrome which has a similar kind of thing with actually a, um, a commonly available antihypertensive drug of, as, the, as the drug. So a lot of uh, things that just really aren't so far-fetched even though this is pretty complicated stuff. The, um, This is uh, one of these, um, these studies in which um, kind of looks at the specificity of this association of this SNP. Uh, and um, it pr this particularly confers risk for prostate cancer, but it looks like it's protective of type 2 diabetes. And again, there are many questions arise about how this single SNP could be doing this. But in fact, within the same study done in Iceland, and then replicated in a larger group of, of patients. Here you see the cases of controls, um, quite a substantial number of cases of controls. Um, there's an odds ratio of 1.2, um, highly significant um, as a causative, as a susceptibility factor for prostate cancer. But then within the same study, again, once you have your, um, your genes done in a, uh, in a group, you can uh, do a, uh, cases of controls for a number of, of uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and here you have, for type 2 diabetes case control studies, you have an odds ratio 
significantly less than one protective of type 2 diabetes. And in fact, there apparently, I didn't know about it, but apparently there is a literature which shows an inverse relationship in populations of prostate cancer in type 2 diabetics. Um, but it, to some extent, the, the insight of that was, was, um, was heightened by this potential genetic basis for that. So some of the specificity of these genes may not be particularly having to do with um, their mechanism of action. Let's talk a little bit about personalized medicine. This is, uh, is a, a very popular term, probably means different things to different people, but at least to the boss at the NHGRI, um, it means that personalized medicine refers to using information about um, a person's genetic makeup to tailor strategies for detection, treatment, and prevention of disease. And I think most of us who um, think about personalized medicine think about the human genome and the use of genetic markers. Uh, each, each person's personalized individual signature that would have impact on the approach to their um, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease uh, on, again, a very individualized basis. The, um, one of the things that has been pointed out is that family history uh, starts out, uh, is perhaps the, the first step of uh, a personalized medicine program. Um, and unfortunately, um, we're not so good at taking family histories. Um, uh, a, a book on um, Terry and My Shelf uh, is a Physical Diagnosis by DeGowan and DeGowan. And if you look in that book, there's nothing on taking a family history at all. Um, it just isn't in the book on how to take a history. Um, and so uh, maybe we aren't, shouldn't be surprised. The other thing is, is that once a proband occurs in the midst, it doesn't look like we're very good on acting about it at all. And this is a study I did with a medical student uh, a while back. We had 5,620 consecutive patients admitted to 53 uh, randomly selected hospitals around the country. Everybody had standard criteria for coronary disease on entry. And when we reviewed these 5,620 discharge plans, only 37 of them, 0. 7% identified a plan to screen the first degree relatives. And it actually didn't matter if the person was 35 with their heart attack or, or, or 75 with their heart attack. Uh, it wasn't part of anybody's plans. And we followed these folks up six months after discharge and only about one out of six children had ever been screened regardless of the risk or risk factors in the proband. So as we look at screening for genetic factors, I might say, well, why don't we do the things like asking, has your mother, father, sister, or brother had heart disease first before we do all the heart disease genes, for which we have no evidence that we're actually doing, okay, because we really aren't, um, aren't getting it there. Uh, so that uh, uh, family history uh, is part of this, so, you know, it's like, you know, it's right there. What are the, what are the, what is the question? This is a, another rendition of a slide already shown by Terry. Is it, you know, this is, this is a person at genetic risk. Uh, it's not a, you know, a cow. It, it's, what is the question? Um, so uh, we should do that. Now, one of the efforts, and uh, Alan Guttmacher of, um, of the NHGRI is uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, leaders of this. Uh, is a multi-agency uh, initiative in the Health and Human Services. It's the uh, my uh, the U.S. Surgeon General's uh, Family uh, History Initiative, a and one of them one of the parts of this is my family health portrait. It's a web-based tool to collect and organize family history information. I've given you the website. Uh, you can e actually get a printout to share with your healthcare providers. So from the previous slide, kind of saying, okay, if you're not going to collect it, I'll collect it, and maybe you could do something about it. Um, and, of course, Thanksgiving Day here in late November is, um, has been for the last several years the National Family History Day. So while you're sitting around carving up your turkey, you should be drawing a genotype, uh, a, a pedigree on your, um, your wall or something, um, and encourage Americans to talk about and write down health problems that run in their family. So the point is, is that um, I think this is really the, uh, the first step, and we're going to talk 
about some of the evidence there is is that is the U.S. population or the U.S. healthcare population, uh, healthcare providers are really ready um, for some of the genetic and genomic information that is currently available commercially. And I think most of us would agree, and there's been multiple editorials from multiple sources, is, is that we're probably not. And there's a whole group at NHGRI that, that, um, that work on um, the many issues here. Well, the other point of it is it's to say that genetic screening is something new is actually not really correct because, of course, um, there has been uh, newborn screening um, uh, for some years. This is not uh, necessarily DNA screening. Some of this probably should be followed up with DNA screening, but we have been screening for, for uh, genetic diseases for some time. The, by far the most common is congenital hearing loss, but you can see a variety of others. And, um, and so we have been screening and putting into, um, uh, into action the genetic counseling and the follow-up of, of these children for, um, for a long time. So there's, there really is a precedent and, and, and something to build on, and obviously some of these experiences we need to, um, to take forward. So, so uh, an effective screening a program obviously needs to have analytic validity. Uh, that is, is that um, uh, we know what we're measuring and, um, and there's good reproducibility, et cetera. Uh, clinical validity in terms of it, um, it uh, measuring what we want to measure. Um, obviously, these are a variety of issues with some of our genomic ones. But I really want to talk about clinical utility as we roll things out. Some of the, the uh, genomic quality issues uh, Terry's already covered up here. Uh, the condition uh, should be frequent enough to justify the cost of, of screening. Uh, the detection should be otherwise um, not, uh, detection would not otherwise occur at an early enough stage to uh, perhaps prevent disease. Early treatment pre prevents morbidity, treatments available, and family and personnel are available to perform the um, uh, screening and form about results and institute the treatment. So, so um, the, um, the whole point is, is that uh, uh, we, in terms of, of the application of genetic markers to clinical practice, and this is from uh, Greg Furo from, um, uh, from the, um, the NHGRI and uh, one of uh, the other members in the um, office of the director in this editorial recently in JAMA, obviously identifies four barriers to really carrying this, this out. The first is really lack of information about how these prevalence and uh, how the prevalence and risk contribution of markers varies across populations. We have a lot of data in Europeans, perhaps North Americans, et cetera, um, but other population groups obviously may have very different risk and certainly we have plenty of examples where uh, the prevalence of a gene or its impact on disease varies tremendously from one population to the next. Uh, we have limited data on, on how the inheritance of multiple markers um, affects an individual's risk. We just talked about that, uh, this whole gene-gene um, uh, interaction, et cetera. Uh, and so this whole uh, risk assessment uh, quality. Uh, there's little information about how most genetic risk factors interact with environmental factors, again, the gene environment issue. And then finally, and maybe um, uh, most desperate in terms of, of our our research needs are that fewer studies, few studies in common diseases uh, have tested the effectiveness of interventions on, on genetic risk factors. Um, really, again, identifying those markers, identifying the target, uh, target, uh, um, targets for, for drugs uh, and going ahead and testing them. One of the issues, and uh, we've had a lot of discussions in the uh, Northwestern faculty uh, have uh, um, Dr. Greenland and uh, uh, Lloyd Jones and uh, others uh, have uh, commented uh, on um, on some of the biomarker issues um, as as very appropriate to do, but one of the points is you could look at a, a genome marker as just to do a new biomarker test, uh, and uh, so you'll have patients at risk for disease. You can take people at general risk or perhaps people at high risk with family histories, etc. But one of the real keys at the end of the day is, is to show that, that this is cost effective. 
And the number of studies on any biomarker, I don't care what it is, be it an imaging test or a, uh, a uh, serum marker or, or a gene marker, uh, there are very few studies in which have used randomized designs in which the new test then would reclassify individuals in low and high risk and treat them accordingly and look for the outcome and compare whether or not with usual care in which this marker wasn't used, they just went ahead with treatment or no treatment and see what happens. If you look at the literature, there's very few of those. And one of the reasons there's very few of those is that from com a commercial standpoint, once you develop a marker and are able to sell it, you have very little interest in this kind of a study because all the study could do is actually show low cost effectiveness and actually be a commercial disincentive for its use. So I think this is a place for governmental funding. Uh, we really need to know this kind of cost effectiveness um, research and I think the genome markers would, uh, would fit in uh, these as well. Well, uh, I wish I had a, um, a, a Larson cartoon about the elephant out of the barn, um, but uh, it certainly is. I've taken off all the commercial uh, names of this, but this is uh, from a recent uh, piece in uh, JAMA about screening, but there you can obviously a variety of uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testings are available. Uh, certainly the whole genome, uh, 23andMe, um, uh, whole, uh, several companies, uh, and, and uh, these are complex tr uh, risk um, screenings based on SNPs discovered through uh, their ongoing research. Uh, you can also get single or multiple trait testing uh, for conditions or specific diseases um, using proprietary panels. Um, there's obviously some uh, studies available for paternity and family relationships, particularly using mitochondrial and Y chromosome panels. And there's some others. There's even some that you can get to tell you which diet to, um, to, to, to use. And so um, many of these are available. And so what's going to be increasingly happening uh, is, is that uh, if you're a practitioner, someone's going to come um, with a, a printout of um, the polymorphisms that you have, that, you're, that your patient has, and you're going to be basically asked, so what do I do now? And obviously this is going to not be um, uh, because um, we're already quite uh, uh, obvious that um, many of the simple family screenings of taking, a, say, a blood pressure in the child of a hypertensive patient not being done, wait until you get to this level of complexity. And so there's been a variety of, uh, of issues of, about this. So here we are. This is us. We're almost free. We've all figured out the genomics. We're about to, oops. Um, I think it's only about to uh, get more complicated. And um, um, I think there's going to be a flood. Now having said that, there obviously are some examples of, of uh, genetic markers which have been uh, I think considered and used. Uh, these are the lifetime risks for cancer of the breast and of the ovary of these two BRCA uh, markers. And you can see there are substantial lifetime risks of some very bad, uh, bad diseases. Uh, and so um, the natural history of this particular marker is, um, is uh, well worked out. Unfortunately, um, uh, and this is from Wiley Burke um, uh, from the uh, Jackson Lab course, uh, obviously points out that relatively little of the total incidence of breast cancer, unfortunately, is, is identified by the BRCA1 and 2 testing. And so the fallback position would be really to test the, uh, the affected relatives with breast or ovarian cancer. And then if she were positive, offer to affected relatives. This is, not, um, this is not an unconsequential cost. Um, and I'm wondering if these are going to be coming down, if you can get your whole genome for $1,000. Um, um, but anyway, um, and the, um, obviously there are some things you could do about it. Uh, prophylactic surgery, oophorectomy and um, mastectomy, uh, tamoxifen, which may only be effective in, in some of the groups, and obviously a much um, more attentive look at a breast cancer screening, maybe using breast MRI. Uh, 
Uh, so there are some examples to lead our way in terms of our approach to this. Um, uh, so I don't think it's all just uh, hopelessness. This um, review by Schweiner uh, really looked at the delivery of genomic medicine for chronic diseases um, currently in the literature. There were, there were uh, essentially three or four areas, the outcomes of genetic services, consumer information needs, and barriers to integrations. The key findings were um, really a modest positive effects on anxiety, improvement, reduction of anxiety um, uh, with the results of screening. Uh, mixed results uh, on behavior change in terms of people, say, uh, following up with, uh, uh, with screening recommendations, et cetera. Very few studies with clinical outcomes. In terms of the clinical information needs, uh, some, uh, I think, very convincing evidence that there are low levels of genetics knowledge, um, but basically positive attitudes uh, toward um, a genetic testing. Uh, but some great concern of the inadequacy of the primary care workforce to provide uh, the counseling and referral, uh, et cetera. Uh, in terms of barriers to integration, um, um, uh, there had been some concern about the oversight of these testing, how this testing was going to be, uh, be done and the quality of it. Um, so uh, many of our um, lab certification issues, I think, uh, can address this. Uh, and there's considerable concern about the use of these data, the pri privacy and, in the case of uh, a positive finding, discrimination of that person against them. Uh, and so uh, this is kind of what's out there in terms of the use of genetic services um, and identify some of the issues we would have in terms of, um, of translating these into, um, into care. One of the uh, positive step forwards is the um, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, which is on the president's desk, and if he weren't marrying daughters, apparently would have been signed already. Um, um, this was, uh, I think, the primary author on the House side of this was actually uh, my congresswoman, Louise Slaughter, from uh, our district in New York. Um, and um, this really is a necessary a building block because one of, as you've seen, one of the literature, the, the study's results identifies uh, concerns about, um, uh, about uh, discrimination uh, if you do have your studies, uh, genetic uh, studies done. Uh, and, um, and this um, law then um, fixes the problem, at least in the areas of health insurance and employment. So it, it prohibits health insurers from either requesting um, or requiring genetic information on individuals or their family members or using it for decisions on coverages, rates, et cetera. And this includes individuals who get genetic testing as part of research studies. So for those of us in research, uh, obviously is, um, has this important part as well. And it also prohibits employers from requesting or requiring information or using it in decisions requiring hiring, firing in terms of employment. Now there's still many other issues um, involved, but certainly I think um, this has been in the works for 10 years, right, Terry? 12 years. 12 years, yeah. So it's been in, but it, it like passed 490 to 5 or uh, in the House, and I think there was only one senator that voted against it, and I didn't understand that. So um, apparently this will be uh, law, and uh, obviously it's a step forward for for uh, the implementing and the practical aspects of genetic screening. I want to just say a couple of uh, things about pharmacogenetics. Uh, this field is the study of the differences in drug response to the allelic variation in genes affecting drug metabolism, efficacy, and toxicity. It's an enormous, it's a course in itself. Uh, <clears throat> but just to say is, is that uh, we know there's a, a number of the aspects of of drug metabolism that are under genetic control, particularly having to do with, with uh, the systems that break down drugs and the allelic variations then um, being either the normal metabolizers, the poor metabolizers in which the gene product doesn't break down the, uh, the, uh, the drug as much, or a fast metabolizers in which um, you're, um, you're um, forced to try to keep up, um, it, maybe you have to use a higher dose to get the same say, blood level or therapeutic um, level. So there's obviously um, plenty to suggest that um, 
the genes are very important here, and, and we know that there's tremendous heterogeneity across populations. These are, um, if you're into tuberculosis control, the slow, the slow acetylator phenotype uh, looking at INH metabolism obviously varies tremendously across populations, uh, so that, um, for example, INH in this group would, could be um, a problem of, of not breaking down the drugs, and in fact, non-supervised uh, INH, the classic studies in Baltimore in the 1950s, unsupervised INH um, use turned out to be somewhat of a public health disaster um, as people with this high prevalence of slow acetylation obviously ended up with liver failure uh, having to do with drug toxicity. Um, you might also say that um, in other populations um, that this would uh, not be a problem and maybe in some populations um, might even be a reason for uh, needing higher doses of this with the Inuits, the uh, uh, Alaskan natives, etc., having a higher tuberculosis rate, at least in the days before drug-resistant TB and AIDS. So the point is there's a lot of variability. Uh, these are the five studies in the uh, GWAS collection so far. Uh, or at least in the first 109 GWAS that dealt with pharmacogenetics, just to make the point that uh, the GWAS um, certainly are a very um, a reasonable tool for looking at this issue, again, in an agnostic, non-hypothesis-driven. Um, non uh, two of them have to do with nicotine, comparing uh, this whole issue of nicotine dependency um, versus non-dependent and how nicotine would really, um, uh, its method of action really. Um, uh, one referred to already by this biome, I think it's one of the better studies, response versus no response in multiple sclerosis therapy to a beta interferon. Um, uh, this uh, direct thrombin inter, um, inhibitor was really a drug toxicity study, uh, but could be, a could be a model for many other uh, hepatotoxicity uh, studies. Uh, and then this uh, methamphetamine dependence, again, another study of addiction um, versus control. So uh, just the point is, is that uh, even within the GWAS um, uh, literature, there's a number of, of, of um, genome-wide association studies looking at, um, at uh, drug-related issues. Really, finally, um, I want to just, uh, in terms of, of comment uh, relative to research, um, uh, the genome-wide association studies um, have um, now um, uh, have a policy at NIH in terms of data sharing, and I think it's been alluded, alluded to before, is that once you do the whole genome, um, there may be the opportunity to study many different phenotypes, uh, and this should be a repository of great national importance so that other investigators uh, may look at, uh, at issues involved. So. Um, uh, the goal of this policy was to make available the genotype and phenotype databases as rapidly as possible to a wide range of scientific investigators. It includes a, um, depositing the data at the uh, National Center for Biotechnology Information and the dbGaP registry that we talked about. Um, obviously, um, plans of, of the data um, submission and, and protection and, uh, and obviously the lack of identification of information, uh, uh, personal information, um, uh, how to access the data, the publication of results, and, uh, and there's some statements on intellectual policy within um, that policy as well. And, and I think the driver of this really has been this open access, which has really um, been, um, been a tremendously um, um, uh, uh, consistent theme at the National Human Genome Research Institute it really has been, and it goes to many others than just the GWAS, but this high kind of opening up the idea that the human genome really isn't a commercial product. Let me tell you a story um, about this open access issue. Um, uh, I was at the, um, at the, um, um, the Bar Harbor course on, uh, on uh, human genetics. And one of the things you could do during that time is see patients. You had a patient day, and I'm a cardiologist, and so a couple of other cardiology professors and I saw a patient. And, 
And um, she was a, 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 a tall, slim person with long arms, etc. And her doctor obviously was um, um, interested. There was a, um, uh, an aneurysm, quote unquote, history in a, a parent. Um, and obviously the question was, uh, was this, did this woman have Marfan syndrome? In fact, there are criteria, major and minor criteria for Marfan. She had one of the major criteria, you need two. And she had about, for the, like five of the other criteria, just a little bit below. So she didn't quite make the, um, all the classic criteria for Marfan's. And so the decision was, well, why don't we just go do her genotype? Well, the genotype was $2,500. And we actually calculated the time from when the, the um, patent on the genotype would expire and how much it would cost us to echocardiogram her every year and treat her with beta blockers. It was far cheaper to do it that way than to get this gene test because of the commercialization of this. And obviously what we'd like to do is to say that this, the technologies and the tests should be patented and this is intellectual property, but the, the, the gene itself should not be something that one could control its use. This should be available to all of us in medicine and in public health for the use of the public's good. And I think all of us were just a little peeved by this whole whole thing, that this is really a barrier to using science as we'd like to. So that's just a little personal vignette. Um, but, um, and, and the GWISE policy and open access and these uh, data are available is, is, I think, part of that philosophy. And so for you investigators who might want to um, uh, request and receive these data, you need to subs uh, submit a subscription, a description of proposed research project. Obviously, this is, this is a scientific uh, research issue. This is not for commercial use or other, uh, other uses. Um, you submit a data access request and it's co-signed by your institutional official. Obviously, there's some uh, commitments to protect data confidentiality. Theoretically, the genome is the ultimate personal identifier, isn't it? There's really only one of them. And so theoretically, this is, um, could be um, uh, abusable, but there are many um, provisions in here to protect th this confidentiality and to ensure data security measures. Um, uh, if there are any problems here, to uh, notify a data access committee about policy violations and then to provide um, annual reports. So uh, I think for our graduate students, et cetera, um, you know, we may not have the exact um, genome, genome wide association study in our own institution, but with this policy provides opportunities for many, many investigators, both trainees and established investigators, um, to be more active. So I just want to um, uh, conclude, say the, uh, this evidence for the causal associations uh, I, I think is, um, is uh, still in formative stages. Uh, uh, the, the whole gene polymorphisms obviously have a little bit different uh, uh, wrinkles to them, um, but still I think fit well within the usual epidemiologic um, constructs for causality. Um, the application of products of genomics um, um, includes susceptibility assessment and uh, pharmacogenomics. Uh, obviously, I think these are some of the uh, low-hanging fruit, but still have some barriers as we've, we've described. Um, unfortunately, technologies are currently being marketed to consumers so that um, this is going to create um, a lot of tension, um, particularly, I think, with the practice community. Uh, and uh, this is particularly so since evidence suggests a low level of genetic knowledge in consumers and low levels of skills to deal with that knowledge in providers. So um, I think uh, genome research really has been particularly benefiting the, um, um, uh, um, the basic scientists, uh, I think the clinical investigators and epidemiologists, I might say, added to that, should really ready themselves to participate in this developing field, and I hope this course has helped to do that. So uh, any questions from mine, and then we'll just close it up. Yes, microphone. I want to clarify something about access to the dbGaP database. We have some of our HAPL participants are involved in an ongoing GWA gene environment study right now. 
It's my understanding that um, the PI of the GWA study itself can specify um, what kind, what kinds of questions can be asked of the data. And so, for yeah. example, in our in uh, situation, our consent form for the DNA for collection of the DNA samples in the first place was very specific about what kinds of analyses could be done. Yeah, I had only so much room on my slide, but thank you for the, the question, and maybe Terry would want to comment on this, and she's been um, involved with all that. But um, your, the scenario you point out is, in fact, identified within the whole policy, if you read it, and that is, is that some of the informed consent um, set specifications about how the data could be or could be not used, and that's what the person signed in terms of consent. And if some of those really basically suggested no other use or or other use outside of this own study, I think that's the answer, unless you want to go back to them and reconsent them, which obviously is a lot of work, uh, as we all know. And uh, so um, th there is uh, the, uh, the ability to, uh, if there is a limitation on the evidence, an opportunity to cite what those limitations are and the reasons for those limitations but I think you can't just limit the whole thing. No, no, right. So it's not, it's, it, you just can't say, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to play. Yeah, or I, I don't want somebody to look at, you know, my, my favorite phenotype, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's based on the consent, but we don't look at the consent form, so we're, there is an element of trust here, and, and obviously if we saw something that looked a little bit suspicious, we'd, we'd ask someone. The, the limitations that we tend to see are used for a specific disease, so it tends to be if this was a schizophrenia study, you only use it for schizophrenia. Um, and the other one is often uh, non-commercial use, so so if, if you're a for-profit user, there are, there are some folks, usually about 10%, 5% of, of participants have, you know, issues with uh, with commercial use and drug companies and that, and so th those will be excluded then if you're a commercial user, but you still can get the rest of the data set. But this is potentially, obviously, an important um, paradigm in translation, um, and certainly in our Clinical Translational Science Awards, I think the idea was consistent with this, is to open up to a much larger community of investigators because um, a lot of people, again, would go in, have their disease of interest, ask their, their question, uh, and then say, I'm done with it, leaving 99.9% .9 of the data really um, unanalyzed. 